Hey guys, Nandini here with the Go and Chess Trio. Today we shall have a look at Akiba Rubinstein's immortal game. Before we get to the game, let's get to know a little about him. Akiba Rubinstein was a Polish chess grandmaster who is considered to have been one of the strongest players to have never become world champion. His match against Emmanuel Lasker, that is the world championship match, was scheduled. But unfortunately for him, the World War I broke out and he lost his chance to play the world championship or become world champion. Rubenstein is also considered one of the best endgame players of all time and also a master of rook endgames. Akiba Rubenstein was technically very sound as well as tactically very accurate. He's absorbed a lot from William Stainitz's games. So Rubenstein did win the fifth All-Russian Championship. One of his wins from this championship is popularly known as his Immortal Game. Let's have a look at it. D4, D5, Knight F3, E6, E3, C5. So this is kind of the Queen's Gambit declined with further variations. And here, Rot really played the move D into C5, which is not played much these days because of the obvious reasons that Black simply develops his bishop without losing a tempo after bishop into C5. But probably at that point of time, they used to play this more often. So let's just not get deep into the opening variations. So over here, White plays the move A3 with the idea of going B4, bishop B2, and maybe B5 too. So he's basically planning to expand on the queen side. So here, Rubinstein plays the move a6, maybe just stopping the b4, b5 ideas and stopping white's expansion here and maybe even keeping a square for the bishop if required. Or, you know, he also has similar ideas of d to c4 and b5 and expanding on the queen side himself. So over here, white continued with b4 and Rubinstein played the move bishop d6. Now, I do see the d5 pawn is hanging. Now, the question is, is the d5 pawn actually hanging and can white go for the d5 pawn? Give it a thought and then continue the video. So over here, if white does capture c into d5, e into d5 and goes for the pawn, this would have been a blunder. And let's say a small trap Rubinstein put on his opponent because the queen on d5 is hanging and black has a tactical blow of bishop b4, a discovered attack. It's a check on the king and the queen is attacked by the black queen. So whatever white does, white should be losing his queen here. So it's obvious that white did not fall for this. So let's go back. So bishop d6 is not leaving the pawn hanging in short. So white continued development with bishop b2. And Rubinstein took his king to safety by castling. And over here, Rotwelly played the move queen d2. Now, this move does seem to be a bit premature because uh, black would probably develop his queen to e7 in the future and rook d8. And then his queen would again be on the file of the black rook. And again, the queen would have to make a move to keep herself safe. So, this is... This does seem to be a bit premature, but uh, maybe instead of queen d2, white could have gone with c into d5. And again, I'm not saying that white should go to capture the pawn. So over here, what white's idea could be is try to keep the pawn an isolated queen spawn. It's called an isolated queen spawn because it's an isolated pawn and on the queen's file. So an isolated queen spawn. So he could try to exploit this isolated queen spawn later on in the game. But black is doing completely fine here, I should say. But this would give both players equal chances. And this is probably the best way for white to continue. But anyway, let's get back to the game. After castling, Rot really played the move queen d2. And here, Rubinstein played the move queen e7. But over here, after queen e7, it does allow c into d5 again. So I would say I would have preferred to play something like maybe uh, d into c4 here. And after bishop into c4, I could continue with queen e7, rook d8, b5 and go for it. Because I uh, personally would not like to play with an isolated queen spawn in that position. I don't know. It's just my choice. So anyway, let's just go back. So over here, 
Uh, Rubinstein played the move queen e7. So as I said, white again could have gone with cd, ed and uh, bishop e2 and continue this game the way it is. I mean, it's definitely not bad for both the players. But accepting the gambit over here, accepting this pawn would be too risky for white because if he does go to capture the pawn now, yes, there is no rook or queen over here. So white is definitely not going to be losing his queen. But the point of this is... Uh, black plays a move bishop e6 over here and black is really up in development as you see his rooks are already connected and he has developed his bishop now again the black queen is under attack so the queen has to move and other than that the white king is still in the center the bishop is not developed the rooks are not connected so black will be <laughs> having a real good development advantage so this just does seem to be too risky for white to get into. In this position after queen e7, Rotwelly made a mistake. He played the move bishop d3. Again, my suggestion to you all would be please pause the video and try to figure out well, how should black continue over here and can you think and play like Rubinstein. So yes, getting back to the answer. This is a mistake because this allows black to develop his queen side pieces or let's say expand in the queen side, gaining a tempo. So the answer is simple. Now d into c4. The bishop already made one move and this is the bishop's second move now with bishop into c4. And this is what Rubinstein did do in the game. And then b5 again asking the bishop to move. So bishop d3 was chosen. Yes, bishop d3 is probably the best diagonal for the bishop because as you see at least it has some play. Taking the bishop back to e2 would be maybe not that great and here again he doesn't really have too much play because the bishop would be blocked so bishop d3 and over here rubinstein continued with the rook d8 idea we have already spoken about so he gets the rook on the file of the queen and the bishop so over here there could be threats later on on the board on this d file so Rotwelly decides to take his queen to safety immediately and place the move queen e2. So this was what I was saying when I said the move queen d2 was a bit premature. The queen had to move again as we discussed. So over here, uh, bishop b7, uh, white took his king to safety by castling. So again, in this position, I would suggest please pause the video and try to figure out how should black continue? What should be black's idea over here? Getting to the answer, Rubinstein played the best move in the position and that is knight e5. If you all did find the move knight e5, well that's wonderful because knight e5 is a very common menu in such positions because you want to get rid of the f3 knight. The f3 knight is the only piece right now defending the white king and if the knight on f3 is off the board, the two black bishops have two beautiful diagonals targeting the white king so that is a basic idea with knight e5 and yes this is even stronger right now because of the tempi black gained earlier in the opening so in this position white captured knight into e5 and black captured bishop into e5 and white continued playing the move f4 and yes it does seem a bit awkward but White would have to play such a committal move sometime in the future, if not now. So the move f4 just blocks the dark squared bishop's diagonal over here. But let's have a look at what other options White had if he does not really make such a committal move right away. So let's just say he goes and continues with rook fd1 here, developing his rook, getting into the open d file. Here black can continue with queen c7, putting pressure on the c3 knight as you see, as well as the h2 pawn. Now, this is a double attack. If white does go to save the knight, let's say with rook ac1, black can capture bishop into h2, and after king h1, and this would be a discovered attack on black's queen. So over here, black has to play the move queen b8 first, getting the queen to safety. And the point is, usually in such positions, when you do capture h2, 
uh, white can get g3 on the board. But the point is in this position, g3 is not possible because the bishop on b7 is pinning the pawn. So here black simply wins the pawn. So after rook fd1, it does seem like black simply gets queen c7 and gains an advantage. We'll just get back to the game. He played the move f4 in this position. So now after f4, it does seem like some squares have been weakened and black should be able to take advantage of this because a move like f4 is not really considered to be great. But well, what option did white have? So after f4, black continued with bishop c7. Of course, he would love to go b8, but that is in case the rook was already on c8. So if the black rook was on c8, then he could have gone to b8, but that's fine. Bishop c7 and e4 was played in the game. Now, again, the point is after bishop c7, black is having ideas of playing e5 or maybe e4. Well, depending on what white does, but e5. Of e4 was played in this position with direct ideas of maybe going e5 or just let's just say blocking now at least both the diagonals are blocked so i'm sure white is kind of feeling safe in this position but it's still not that safe because black continued with rook a c8 now developing his rook so if you see black's pieces black's pieces are kind of perfectly placed e5 was played if you just see now this is opening not just the light squared bishop guys but also the dark squared uh diagonal is all open now so ah uh, this is gonna get <laughs> it's gonna get really interesting now so after e5 black immediately takes advantage of this so the uh bishop b6 check king h1 and can you guys find black's move in this position pause the video and try to figure it out and try to find the whole tactical combination so black played the move knight g4 now i'm sure white did definitely not miss this move on the board when he chose to play the move e5 but he may have missed the moves maybe later on in the variations a move even one if you miss even one move in a line that's enough to lose a game so yes knight g4 a really good move in this position because if queen into g4 is played you pick up the d3 bishop and uh, again the c3 knight is definitely attacked because we all know that two pieces are usually considered stronger than a rook. So black's immediate threat in this position is just capturing on c3 and uh, getting two pieces for the rook. And with two beautiful bishops here, black should be definitely the player winning the game. Uh, capturing on g4 does not seem to be a good option for white well what other options can he have we'll have to have a look at that because in the game he did play the move bishop e4 trying to uh, block this diagonal and trying to trade pieces but let's have a look at a couple of more options before that instead of bishop e4 what if he tries to play something like h3 well, this is definitely not a good move because you're immediately weakening the dark squares too. But we'll have a look at it because a few of y'all may definitely have this in mind. So over here, black has queen h4 once again. Whenever there is no knight on f3, you always can try for this queen h4 move and activate the queen to directly attack your opponent's king. So after queen h4, yes, queen into g4 is possible. But again, after queen g4, hg4, rook d3, the funny thing is, there are two threats in this position. One is definitely capturing this knight, but the main threat is, as you see, I've marked on the board in green, rook h3, and that is a checkmate. <laughs> so white has to play something like this, and you can, oh, well, you could definitely go for rook into c3, but I think you can also go rook d2 and just continue the game. Anything's just winning for black here. So let's get out of this line. h3 is definitely bad for white. And if white does say that, okay, I want to maybe, maybe I don't want to allow rook into d3. So I want to play bishop into h7 check first. And after king into h7, I gain a pawn and then I capture queen into g4. Well, yes, white has gained a pawn, but the position is still really bad for white because black simply has rook d2 and rook on the seventh rank again, guys. Now, this is going to be terrible for white. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, again, not possible. Another last option as blocking it with the knight. So knight e4 is again possible, but again, we know the ideas. Queen h4, having a queen into h2, checkmate threat. If h3 is played now, this is a beautiful, again, a very nice tactic over here. Uh, try to pause the video and figure it out. 
So here black has the move rook into d3, a beautiful sacrifice. And after queen into d3, bishop into e4, queen into e4, and queen g3. Now, if white does capture, black has queen h4. And it's a checkmate because of a lovely dark squared bishop controlling the g1 square. So getting back, um, <laughs> this is not really possible. So after bishop e4, now you can imagine what kind of tactical blow came in the game because of the variations we've already had a look at now. So after bishop e4, black continued queen h4. This is obvious. I'm sure most of you all may have thought about it. Again, having a direct checkmate threat. G3 was played in the game and it's not possible. Well, nothing is possible to be honest. So we we'll first have a look at h3 in this position. Um, so the move rook into c3 is possible here. And after bishop into c3, again bishop into e4. Now why was the move uh, rook into c3 played? Well, because a knight is the piece defending the bishop. So if you sacrifice your rook and then capture, again you get this queen g3 idea and the queen h4 checkmate. So let's get back. Um, so g3 was played in the game. After which, again, a beautiful tactical blow. Uh, if you have not calculated as yet, please do pause the video and try to figure out what is Black's best move in this position and how did Rubinstein finish the game in style. So over here, Rubinstein played the move rook into c3, giving a queen sacrifice. So what really happens for g into h4? Well, he did play g into h4, so we are going to get to know that. So let's just see what happens if bishop into c3 first, if the rook is captured. We already know. The queen is overloaded in this position, defending two, uh, uh, two threats. So after bishop into e4, queen e4, queen h2 is simply a checkmate. So that was quite simple. So in this position, after g3, rook into c3, it's a beautiful queen sacrifice, by the way. So after g into h4, black plays the move, rook d2, another piece sacrifice. I mean, wow. I mean, just, just look at Rubinstein's tactical skills over here. So after rook d2, queen into d2, and bishop into e4, Again, you realize why rook d2 was played, right? Because the queen was the only piece protecting the bishop. So after queen d2, bishop e4, the king has nowhere to go. While well, he can play rook f3 or queen g2, well, it does not make a difference. So he played the move queen g2. And can you guys find black's best move in this position? So yes, the last move of the game after which Rotwelly resigned is rook h3. The queen is already pinned, so the queen can't really capture the rook and has just a simple rook into h2 checkmate, which is just unstoppable. So whatever white does, he is getting checkmated in a couple of moves. So this is a beautiful game. You realize how technically sound Rubinstein was and how tactically accurate he was. I mean, this game is one of the best examples of this. And yes, this was and is Rubinstein's immortal game. And I guess it's going to remain one of the best games ever. And this is a game which every generation is definitely going to have a look at. So if you did enjoy this video, please give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the bell icon if you do not want to miss any further videos from us. So I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.